Okay, let's have a look at game six. Nigel Short playing white against Kasparov. E4, after E5, what do we see? They've been looking too much at my Warzone videos. They, we see a gambit, the King's Gambit, or ICC Blitz videos. The King's Gambit is pretty cool, I think, for five minute chess, especially for Blitz. The pressure, the initiative, putting the opponent under pressure, getting them to crack. Okay. Kasparov takes the pawn, he accepts the gambit. And now we have the queen check invitation line with bishop c4. So the two main uh, lines, either knight f3 protecting h4, or the other the other way is bishop c4 inviting, positively inviting, queen h4 check. Kasparov doesn't want to do that. Instead he wants to challenge the white centre, he plays knight f6. And now, okay, white has to be careful for a quick d5 now. So not only what he wants to protect the pawn, he wants to try and prevent uh, d5. So knight c3 ticks both those boxes. Let's just make sure of that from a theoretical point of view for the king's gambit, the aspiring king's gambit player. If d3, d5, and look at the evaluation already in black's favour. See that's why this requires great mastery to take care of the finesses. Knight c3 is the way forward here I think keeping uh, white with an interesting position. Knight c3 and we see the advantage for black is minimal based on material. It's it's slowly shrinking down. So you see it's a playable position here. It's not completely lost even though white is a pawn down. If white can get the pawn back then we have King's Gambit trump cards, the f-file pressure, central you know um, pawn majority sometimes. So c6 Kasparov is actively trying to fight for the centre with d5. And now this next move by Nigel preempts d5. He he retreats the bishop to b3, so it's not going to be with tempo. d5, and now he's got um one would think the option of e5 here. I suspect e5 is unplayable. He did take on d5 here, but I suspect e5 is unplayable. Let's let's just make sure of that. E5 Knight e4, big advantage to black. There's a threat, you see, of queen h4. And if knight f3 here, then black has all sorts of things, even g5 apparently. Um, the problem here is d3 is now inhibited, unless, unless white wants double pawns. So black's really getting um, a big advantage from doing not much, and even still has the queen h4 check. So white has to be very careful, of course in this King's Gambit territory. So E takes D5 and now D4 firmly establishing a pawn in the center just wanting to collect back his pawn on F4 and in fact now after Bishop D6 we don't see the routine uh, Knight F3 which doesn't really contribute much to regaining the pawn. Instead we see Knight G E2. Now unless Kasparov uh, wants to try his luck with g5, that pawn's going. He played actually um, knight c6. Let's check out g5 from a theoretical point of view. So g5 here, h4 is the key undermining move. There's no h6 here because hg and we got the rook. So if takes, knight takes f4 might be better apparently than anything else. Check. The king could move here. And white has the advantage, you see, look at that, justifying the king's gambit here in this line. And d5 might even be dropping off now. So advantage to white. So knight c6, just uh, letting Nigel get the pawn back. So bishop takes f4. The opening here I think has been justified now. Both sides castle. So white has a nice rook on the f-file, nice f-file pressure. He has a potentially nice outpost square on f5 if he can get a knight to f5 later to celebrate that semi open f file. Bishop e6 and now queen d2 connecting the rooks, uh, freeing the knight maybe for such a maneuver now because the queen's now protecting the bishop. Bishop actually goes to e7. Okay. Black is not interested in bishop exchange at the moment. What he is interested in is generating some queenside counterplay, I would imagine. After rook a e1, first though he 
puts his rook now on e8 to give some flexibility perhaps for bishop f8 to king h1 now the queen side counterplay starts with a6 okay so knight g3 and now Kasparov continues playing on the queen side b5 this bishop you'll note is kind of hemmed in at the moment blocked by that pawn on d5 so black has set up a kind of fortress on d5 here solid fortress uh, what does white want to do with the bishop maybe you know white wants to get the bishop on this diagonal eyeing sensitive h7 square so actually knight d1 looks good from that point of view play c3 and bishop c2 next uh, but it's not allowed here Kasparov now is ready to seize that light square bishop with knight a5 and after c3 in fact he does take it doubling white's pawns now a consequence of this doubling of the pawns is that knight e4 is also now on the cards to liberate this bishop to attack that poor pawn so knight e4 is played now actually so after knight takes pawn takes uh, the pawns attacked uh, now white could consider perhaps you would think taking on e4 and not minding bishop takes b3 I would imagine just from my intuitive evaluation of this position that this a pawn might actually be a runner combined with these two bishops raking down the queen side but let's have a quick check of the variations here why isn't rook takes e4 possible rook e4 is given as one of the stronger moves bishop takes b3 it might be easier for black to play though oh, it's about dead equal now see I wonder if there's an implication now of, of the a pawn being dangerous at some point get the rooks off I'm just waiting for this implication now of this these two pawns being useful probably not going to get it that easily but it looks as though the bishops are controlling usefully squares on the queen side so blacks virtually equal here okay so Nigel did perhaps the right practical decision just to hold on to b3 here queen c2 black now um, plays rook c8 he doesn't mind uh, rook e4 here because of bishop f5 skewering the rook against the queen um, queen e4 there's bishop takes b3 uh, also there's now a threat actually of queen takes d4 because there's a pin on the c pawn to the queen probably for this reason knight e3 was played but also as well as protecting the queen uh, d5 is potentially on the cards now gaining space in the center so white has potential central pawn mobility here this is already a problem for black this d pawn this knight on e3 is quite beautiful um, the last time I saw a knight, uh, beautiful um, Nigel Short knight um, was on d3 against Kathy Forbes in this TV match which he won crushingly here's a beautiful blockading central knight against Kasparov okay what does Kasparov do here does a sort of nuisance move actually Bishop h4 white of course doesn't want to weaken you know his king side by playing g3 he has to move the rook somewhere uh, one would think so he moves actually to d1 it's a logical place supporting d5 f5 is now played supporting that e pawn and now d5 gaining space and now gaining more space in the center c4 and doesn't mind if these double pawns get dissolved if he has to take b take c4 that wouldn't be such a crying shame he's straightening out his pawn structure Kasparov plays queen b6 he's keeping a dark square blockade for the moment c5 in particular being held up but now d6 blocking voluntarily blocking Nigel's own bishop but he's making way for the d5 square to be used in many variations either with the rook or the knight so Kasparov is under difficulty here to play this position as black even though he's got the bishop pair it's difficult to play he dissolves white's double pawns voluntarily now so what's the advantage queen c6 setting up a light square blockade and maybe with the intention now of using the b file uh, put pressure on the b file b3 was played actually, actually engines like here just going for it with b4 and here's an example variation if a5 you, you can just ignore uh, the pawn set you can just play b5 and you can always evict a queen from c5 with rook d5 so that's no problem 
uh, let's say bishop d8 you can still plow on um, here with c5 apparently because check and this starts to get nasty even b5 because this d pawn is one of the strongest pass pawns but here look at these rooks look at what the engine turns up d7 so this is why b4 might have actually been a really good move here um, instead the more timid b3 is played but Kasparov goes nuts here absolutely nuts um, maybe he senses he, he wants to lift this blockade but he seems a bit overly irritated by it um, there are various moves which don't involve uh, weakening pawn moves um, easy for us to say with engines uh, armchair analysts but uh, a5 for example but still white would be better after a5 even if b4 is held up the a5 pawn is actually a target like this variation could demonstrate a5 could be blocked from protection from the bishop and then now it could be targeted with advantage to white uh, okay so it's tricky if a5 is not played say bishop d8 so giving white the opportunity for b4s uh, queen f2 might be good as well actually just just taking advantage of, of the bishop not on that square so maybe even b4 as well here is is good I can imagine if b4 was good earlier it's probably going to be good here as well famous last words no b4 would be terrible here <laughs> because g5 is actually a very good move here in this position <laughs> Uh, if the bishop, where is the bishop going without allowing f4? Ouch! So that's a slight technical issue to bear in mind in this position. <laughs> that actually g5 under the right circumstance with the bishop back on d8 is is quite a menacing threat uh, tactically. So what Xbraff did, maybe uh, he, he has the right idea, slightly wrong implementation maybe. Maybe bishop d8 is an improvement. He played g5 immediately. Okay. And of course, um, Nigel has options here. He can either retreat the bishop, um, but actually, there's also a stunning engine resource found here, um, namely knight takes f5. Wow. Okay. So if g takes, let's let's just turn on the computer to avoid embarrassment here. I assume it's knight takes h4. If g takes, simply knight takes h4. And if we follow this like prepared. Item, now remember this d7 bishop takes g5 here so two bishops are now attacked bishop takes g5 rook takes f5 and now g5 is attacked as well as d7 being a menacing threat big advantage to white here so this would have been this would have been crushing if nigel had seen this nevertheless um what nigel uh played isn't bad because actually after this knight takes f5 better for black is not to take on f5 but to play g takes f4 and we have here um, not such a crushing advantage but still better f for white this this variation where white's able to sort of soak up some of the pressure and m maintain uh, a material advantage two pawns up okay so what Nigel played was actually um, a sensible move actually bishop g3 because he's still leaving um, f5 weak here f5 is under pressure that beautiful knight on e3 is doing a fine job here so advantage to white seal as you see here turn that off so took and Kasparov's under trouble he's got weak pawns on on the classic king's gambit f file so one of the major points of the king's gambit was f file pressure and there's a pawn sitting here on f5 not only that white has good uh, default pressure with the d5 square to be useful as an outpost without losing the rook to queen d5 because the knight's on d5 um, so queen c5 doesn't really work out very well queen c5 especially I think this is an excellent move queen f2 because um, potentially this is a tactical liability now this queen on c5 rook f8 and now knight sorry rook d5 exploiting the fact that the queen is vulnerable on c5 and 
Uh, Nigel took the pawn on f5. Even more crushing, apparently, is c5 here. Really making the queen backfire even on b6 on this diagonal. Because if rook takes c5, then knight c4, absolute crush, winning material. But um, instead, knight takes f5, which is also good, was played. So just white starting to, to munch Kasparov here. Material up. Kasparov plays his pass pawn forward but it's uh it's looking really really bad actually he's, he's a goner here he's losing too many pawns off the check rook takes f8 actually he resigned um in this position this pawn's not going anywhere let's examine the two major things that black can do if king takes g7 I believe the rook comes back here, not rook takes c8, because e2 would be embarrassing. The rook has to scurry back to stop the e pawn, I believe, with rook f3. Um, in fact, will rook f4 do? Well, bit bit dicier because of rook b8, um, apparently. No, that's okay as well. But rook f3 is the way to do it to get that pawn before it escapes. Rook scurries back here. Maybe it doesn't, doesn't match about losing b3. White's got material advantage, two pawns up. Hasn't got ma many major threats to deal with. So let's look at, at the alternative um, in this position. Um, rook takes f8. There's rook e5 here, directly attacking the pawn now. And check is not going to help c5 here and look at this c6 coming with the support of the knight so this is crushing as well so there you have it proof that uh, my use of king's gambits all the time on the icc has been vindicated by one of the uk's leading and most established ever grandmasters nigel short he's just used it to defeat one of the greatest players of all time so those of you saying how unsound the king's gambit is I would say to you three words fit for purpose that's an IT term something might seem ugly unsound or whatever but it might be fit for purpose it's fit for blitz and this was increment blitz two seconds increment so Kasparov was in real trouble uh, White had some interesting trump card pressure here useful for blitz Kasparov uh, okay you're gonna say oh g5 was crazy well it's easy for us to say if he just played bishop d8 first then g5 would carry a lot more venom but as it is um, he was concerned he was irritated by white's blockade it would seem um, okay g5 maybe he's horrified by him, himself that he should have played bishop d8 because it carries with it you know hor horrible threats of, of forking pieces uh so it's a bit surprising okay it's a bit of a surprising blunder but you've got to admit white has a nice position otherwise if it wasn't for this um g5 move i mean come on are we supposed to calculate moves like g4 or g5 i mean we're not computers are we <laughs> I'm, I'm referring to my, my, my game last night. <laughs> so moving pawns in front of the, the king, we don't calculate that sort of stuff usually, do we? G5, I mean, blimey. But it is weakening the f, f pawn here, as we can observe now after the knight's protected, the protector of the f pawn's being undermined. And white's starting to get a materially winning position, he just needs to simplify. So after rook takes f8, that's it. Sparth had enough of this game. Comments or questions on YouTube. If you're not already subscribed, please do subscribe. It's free and you'll be notified of any new videos. Thanks very much.